The bright sunshine of the clear mistless morning after the stormy night flooded the main path of the settlement leading from the low shore of the Pante branch of the river to the gate of Abdullah's compound. The path was deserted this morning. It stretched its dark yellow surface, hard beaten by the tramp of many bare feet between the clusters of palm trees, whose tall trunks barred it with strong black lines at irregular intervals, while the newly risen sun threw the shadows of their leafy heads far away over the roofs of the buildings lining the river, even over the river itself as it flowed swiftly and silently past the deserted houses. For the houses were deserted too. On the narrow strip of trodden grass, intervening between their open doors and the road, the morning fires smoldered untended, sending thin fluted columns of smoke into the cool air and spreading the thinnest veil of mysterious blue haze over the sunlit solitude of the settlement. Almayer, just out of his hammock, gazed sleepily at the unwanted appearance of Sambir, wondering vaguely at the absence of life. His own house was very quiet. He could not hear his wife's voice, nor the sound of Nina's footsteps in the big room, opening on the veranda, which he called his sitting room, whenever in the company of white men he wished to assert his claims to the commonplace decencies of civilization. Nobody ever sat there. There was nothing there to sit upon, for Mrs. Almayer and her savage moods, when excited by the reminiscences of the piratical period of her life, had torn off the curtains to make sarongs for the slave girls, and had burnt the showy furniture piecemeal to cook the family rice. But Almayer was not thinking of his furniture now. He was thinking of Dane's return, of Dane's nocturnal interview with Lakamba, of its possible influence on his long matured plans, now nearing the period of their execution. He was also uneasy at the non-appearance of Dane, who had promised him an early visit. The fellow had plenty of time to cross the river, he mused, and there was so much to be done today. The settling of details for the early start on the morrow, the launching of the boats, the thousand and one finishing touches, for the expedition must start complete. Nothing should be forgotten. Nothing should. The sense of the unwanted solitude grew upon him suddenly, and in the unusual silence he caught himself longing, even for the usually unwelcome sound of his wife's voice, to break the oppressive stillness which seemed, to his frightened fancy, to pretend the advent of some new misfortune. What has happened, he muttered, half aloud, as he shuffled in his imperfectly adjusted slippers towards the balustrade of the veranda. Is everybody asleep or dead? The settlement was alive and very much awake. It was awake ever since the early break of day, when Mamat Benjur, in a fit of unheard of energy, arose and, taking up his hatchet, stepped over the sleeping forms of his two wives and walked shivering to the water's edge to make sure that the new house he was building had not floated away during the night. The house was being built by the enterprising Mamat on a large raft, and he had securely moored it just inside the muddy point of land at the junction of the two branches of the Pante, so as to be out of the way of drifting logs that would no doubt strand on the point during the freshet. Mamat walked through the wet grass, saying burrow, and cursing softly to himself the hard necessities of active life that drove him from his warm couch into the cold morning. A glance showed him that his house was still there, and he congratulated himself on his foresight in hauling it out of harm's way, for the increasing light showed him a confused rack of drift logs, half stranded on the muddy flat, interlocked into a shapeless wrap by their branches tossing to and fro and grinding together in the eddy 
caused by the meeting currents of the two branches of the river. Mamat walked down to the water's edge to examine the rattan moorings of his house, just as the sun cleared the trees of the forest on the opposite shore. As he bent over the fastenings, he glanced again carelessly at the unquiet jumble of logs and saw there something that caused him to drop his hatchet and stand up, shading his eyes with his hands from the rays of the rising sun. It was something red, and the logs rolled over it, at times closing round it, sometimes hiding it. It looked to him like a strip of red cloth. The next moment, Mamat had made it out and raised a great shout. Hey, ya, yeah, there, yelled Mamat. There's a man amongst the logs. He put the palms of his hand to his lips and shouted, enunciating distinctly, his face turned towards the settlement. There's a body of the man in the river. Come and see, a dead stranger. The women of the nearest house were already outside, kindling the fires and husking the morning rice. They took up the cry shrilly, and it traveled, so, from house to house, dying away in the distance. The men rushed out excited but silent, and ran towards the muddy point where the unconscious logs tossed and ground and bumped and rolled over the dead stranger with stupid persistency of inanimate things. The women followed, neglecting their domestic duties and disregarding the possibilities of domestic discontent, while groups of children brought up the rear, warbling joyously in the delight of unexpected excitement. Almayer called aloud for his wife and daughter, but receiving no response, stood listening intently. The murmur of the crowd reached him faintly, bringing with it the assurance of some unusual event. He glanced at the river, just as he was going to leave the veranda, and checked himself at the sight of a small canoe crossing over from the Rajah's landing place. The solitary occupant, in whom Almayer soon recognized Babalachi, affected the crossing a little below the house, and paddled up to the Lingard jetty and the dead water under the bank. Babalachi clambered out slowly and went on fastening his canoe with fastidious care, as if not in a hurry to meet Almayer, whom he saw looking at him from the veranda. This delay gave Almayer time to notice and greatly wonder at Babalachi's official get-up. The statesman of Sambir was clad in a costume befitting his high rank. A loudly checkered sarong encircled his waist, and from its many folds peeped out the silver hilt of the chris that saw the light only on great festivals or during official receptions. Over the left shoulder and across the otherwise unclad breast of the aged diplomatist glistened a patent leather belt bearing a brass plate with the arms of Netherlands under the inscription, Sultan of Sambir. Babalachi's head was covered by a red turban, whose fringed ends, falling over the left cheek and shoulder, gave to his aged face a ludicrous expression of joyous recklessness. When the canoe was at last fastened to his satisfaction, he straightened himself up, shaking down the folds of his sarong, and moved with long strides towards Almayer's house, swinging regularly his long ebony staff, whose gold head ornamented with precious stones, flashed in the morning sun. Almayer waved his hand to the right towards the point of land, to him invisible but in full view from the jetty. Oh, Babalachi, oh, he called out. What is the matter there? Can you see? Babalachi stopped and gazed intently at the crowd on the river bank, and after a little while, the astonished Almayer saw him leave the path gather up his sarong in one hand and break into a trot through the grass towards the muddy point. Almayer, now greatly interested, ran down the steps of the veranda. The murmur of men's voices and the shrill cries of women reached him quite distinctly now, and as soon as he turned the corner of his house, 
he could see the crowd on the low promontory swaying and pushing round some object of interest. He could indistinctly hear Babalachi's voice. Then the crowd opened before the aged statesman and closed after him with an excited hum, ending in a loud shout. As Almayer approached the throng, a man ran out and rushed past him towards the settlement, unheeding his call to stop and explain the cause of this excitement. On the very outskirts of the crowd, Almayer found himself arrested by an unyielding mass of humanity. Regardless of his entreaties for a passage, insensible to his gentle pushes as he tried to work his way through it towards the riverside. In the midst of his gentle and slow progress, he fancied suddenly he had heard his wife's voice in the thickest of the throng. He could not mistake very well Mrs. Almayer's high-pitched tones, yet the words were too indistinct for him to understand their purport. He paused in his endeavors to make a passage for himself intending to get some intelligence from those around him. When a long and piercing shriek rent the air, silencing the murmurs of the crowd and the voices of his informants, for a moment Almayer remained as if turned to stone with astonishment and horror. For he was certain now that he had heard his wife wailing for the dead. He remembered Nina's unusual absence, and maddened by his apprehensions as to her safety, he pushed blindly and violently forward, the crowd falling back with cries of surprise and pain before his frantic advance. On the point of land in a little clear space lay the body of the stranger, just hauled out from amongst the logs. On one side stood Babalachi, his chin resting on the head of his staff, and his one eye gazing steadily at the shapeless mass of broken limbs, torn flesh, and blood-stained rags. As Almayer burst through the ring of horrified spectators, Mrs. Almayer threw her own head veil over the upturned face of the drowned man, and squatting by it, with another mournful howl, sent a shiver through the now silent crowd. Mamat dripping wet, turned to Almayer, eager to tell his tale. In the first moment of reaction from the anguish of his fear, the sunshine seemed to waver before Almayer's eyes, and he listened to words spoken around him without comprehending their meaning. When, by a strong effort of will, he regained the possession of his senses, Mamat was saying, That is the way, Tuan. His sarong was caught in the broken branch, and he hung with his head under water. When I saw what it was, I did not want it here. I wanted it to get clear and drift away. Why should we bury a stranger in the midst of our houses, for his ghost to frighten our women and children? Have we not enough ghosts about this place? A murmur of approval interrupted him here. Mamat looked reproachfully at Babalachi. But the Tuan Babalachi ordered me to drag the body ashore. He went on looking around at his audience, but addressing himself only to Almayer, and I dragged him by the feet. In through the mud I have dragged him, although my heart longed to see him float down the river to strand, perchance, on Belangi's clearing. May his father's grave be defiled. There was subdued laughter at this, for the enmity of Mamat and Balangi was a matter of common notoriety and of undying interest to the inhabitants of Sambir. In the midst of that mirth, Mrs. Almayer wailed suddenly again. Allah, what ails this woman? exclaimed Mamat angrily. Here I have touched this carcass which came from nobody knows where and have most likely defiled myself before eating rice. By orders of Tuan Babalachi, I did this thing to please the white man. Are you pleased, O Tuan Almayer, and what will be my recompense? Tuan Babalachi said a recompense there will be, and from you. Now consider. I have been defiled, and if not defiled, I may be under the spell. Look at his anklets. Whoever heard of a corpse appearing 
during the night amongst the logs with gold anklets on its legs. There is witchcraft here, however, added Mamat, after a reflective pause. I will have the anklet if there is permission, for I have a charm against the ghosts, am not, and am not afraid. God is great. A fresh outburst of noisy grief from at Mrs. Almayer checked the flow of Mamat's eloquence. Almayer, bewildered, looked in turn at his wife, at Mamat, at Babalachi, and at last arrested his fascinated gaze on the body lying on the mud with covered face and a grotesquely unnatural contortion of mangled and broken limbs, one twisted and lacerated arm, with white bones protruding in many places through the torn flesh, stretched out, the hand with outspread fingers nearly touching his foot. Do you know who this is? he asked Babalachi in a low voice. Babalachi, staring straight before him, hardly moved his lips, while Mrs. Almayer's persistent lamentations drowned the whisper of his murmured reply, intended only for Almayer's ear. It was fate. Look at your feet, white man. I can see a ring on those torn fingers which I know well. Seeing this, Babalachi stepped carelessly forward, putting his foot as if accidentally on the hand of the corpse and pressing it into the soft mud. He swung his staff menacingly towards the crowd, which fell back a little. Go away, he said sternly, and send your women to their cooking fires, which they ought not to have left to run after a dead stranger. This is men's work. I take him now, in the name of the Raja. Let no man remain here but Tuan Almayer's slaves. Now go. The crowd reluctantly began to disperse. The women went first, dragging away the children that hung back with all their weight on the maternal hand. The men strolled slowly after them in ever-forming and changing groups that gradually dissolved as they neared the settlement and every man regained his own house with steps quickened by the hungry anticipation of the morning rice. Only on the slight elevation where the land sloped down towards the muddy point a few men, either friends or enemies of Mamat, remained gazing curiously for some time longer at the small group standing around the body on the river bank. I do not understand what you mean, Babalachi, said Almayer. What is the ring you are talking about? Whoever he is, you have trodden the poor fellow's hand right into the mud. Uncover his face, he went on, addressing Mrs. Almayer, who, squatting by the head of the corpse, rocked herself to and fro, shaking from time to time her disheveled gray locks and muttering mournfully. Hi, exclaimed Mamat who had lingered close by. Look, Tuan, the logs came together so, and here he pressed the palms of his hands together, and his head must have been between them, and now there is no face for you to look at. There are his flesh, and his bones, the nose, the lips, and maybe his eyes, but nobody could tell the one from the other. It was written the day he was born, that no man could look at him in death and be able to say, This is my friend's face. Silence, Mamat, enough, said Babalachi, and take thy eyes off his anklet, thou eater of pig's flesh. Tuan Almayer, he went on, lowering his voice, Have you seen Dane this morning? Almayer opened his eyes wide and looked alarmed. No, he said quickly, haven't you seen him? Is he not with the Raja? I am waiting. Why does he not come? Babalachi nodded his head sadly. He is come, Tuan. He left last night, when the storm was great, and the river spoke angrily. The night was very black, but he had within him a light that showed the way to your house, as smooth as a narrow backwater, and the many logs no bigger than wisps of dried grass, Therefore he went, and now he lies here. 
and Babalachi nodded his head towards the body. How can you tell? said Almayer excitedly, pushing his wife aside. He snatched the cover off and looked at the formless mass of flesh, hair, and drying mud where the face of the drowned man should have been. Nobody can tell, he added, turning away with a shudder. Babalachi was on his knees, wiping the mud from the stiffened fingers of the outstretched hand. He rose to his feet and flashed before Almayer's eyes a gold ring set with a large green stone. You know this well, he said. This never left Dane's hand. I had to tear the flesh now to get it off. Do you believe me now? Almayer raised his hands to his head and let them fall listlessly by his side in the utter abandonment of despair. Babalachi, looking at him curiously, was astonished to see him smile. A strange fancy had taken possession of Almayer's brain, distracted by this new misfortune. It seemed to him that for many years he had been falling into a deep precipice. Day after day, month after month, year after year, he had been falling, falling, falling. It was a smooth, round, black thing, and the black walls had been rushing upwards with wearisome rapidity. A great rush, the noise of which he fancied he could hear yet, and now, with an awful shock, he had reached the bottom, and behold, he was alive and whole, and Dane was dead, with all his bones broken. It struck him as funny. A dead Malay. He had seen many dead Malays without any emotion, and now he felt inclined to weep. But it was over the fate of a white man. He knew a man that fell over a deep precipice and did not die. He seemed somehow to himself to be standing on one side, a little way off, looking at a certain Almayer who was in great trouble. Poor, poor fellow. Why doesn't he cut his throat? He wished to encourage him. He was very anxious to see him lying dead over that corpse. Why does he not die and end this suffering? He groaned aloud unconsciously and started with a, a fright at the sound of his own voice. Was he going mad? Terrified by the thought, he turned away and ran toward his house, repeating to himself, I am not going mad. Of course not. No, no, no. He tried to keep a firm hold on the idea. Not mad, not mad. He stumbled as he ran blindly up the steps, repeating fast and ever faster those words wherein seemed to lie his salvation. He saw Nina standing there and wished to say something to her, but could not remember what, in his extreme anxiety not to forget that he was not going mad. While he still kept repeating mentally as he ran round the table, till he stumbled against one of the armchairs and dropped into it, exhausted. He sat staring wildly at Nina, still assuring himself mentally of his own sanity, and wondering why the girl shrank from him in open-eyed alarm. What was the matter with her? This was foolish. He struck the table violently with his clenched fist, and shouted hoarsely, Give me some gin. Run! Then, while Nina ran off, he remained in the chair, very still and quiet, astonished at the noise he had made. Nita returned with a tumbler half filled with gin and found her father staring absently before him. Almayer felt very tired now, as if he had come from a long journey. He felt as if he had walked miles and miles that morning and now wanted to rest very much. He took the tumbler with a shaking hand, and as he drank his teeth chattered against the glass, which he drained and set down heavily on the table. He turned his eyes slowly toward Nina standing beside him, and said steadily, Now all is over, Nina. He is dead, and I may as well burn all my boats. He felt very proud of being able to speak so calmly. Decidedly, he was 
not going mad. This certitude was very comforting, and he went on talking about the finding of the body, listening to his own voice complacently. Nina stood quietly, her hand resting lightly on her father's shoulder, her face unmoved, but every line of her features, the attitude of her whole body, expressing the most keen and anxious attention. And so Dane is dead, she said coldly, when her father ceased speaking. Almayer's elaborately calm demeanor gave way in a moment to an outburst of violent indignation. You stand there as if you were only half alive and talk to me, he exclaimed angrily, as if it was a matter of no importance. Yes, he is dead. Do you understand dead? What do you care? You never cared. You saw me struggle and work and strive unmoved and my suffering you could never see. No, never. You have no heart and you have no mind or you would have understood that it was for you for your happiness I was working. I wanted to be rich. I wanted to get away from here. I wanted to see white bowing low before the power of your beauty and your wealth. Old as I am, I wish to seek a strange land, a civilization to which I am a stranger, so as to find a new life in the contemplation of your high fortunes, of your triumphs, of your happiness. For that I bore patiently the burden of work, of disappointment, of humiliation amongst these savages here, and I had it all nearly in my grasp. He looked at his daughter's attentive face and jumped to his feet, upsetting the chair. Do you hear? I had it all there, so within reach of my hand. He paused, trying to keep down his rising anger and failed. Have you no feeling, he went on? Have you lived without hope? Nina's silence exasperated him. His voice rose, although he tried to master his feelings. Are you content to live in this misery and die in this wretched hole? Say something, Nina. Have you no sympathy? Have you no word of comfort for me? I that loved you so? He waited for a while for an answer, and receiving none, shook his fist in his daughter's face. I believe you are an idiot, he yelled. He looked round for the chair, picked it up, and sat down stiffly. His anger was dead within him, and he felt ashamed of his outburst, yet relieved to think that now he had laid clear before his daughter the inner meaning of his life. He thought so in perfect good faith, deceived by the emotional estimate of his motives, unable to see the crookedness of his ways, the unreality of his aims the futility of his regrets, and now his heart was filled only with a great tenderness and love for his daughter. He wanted to see her miserable and to share with her his despair, but he wanted it only as all weak natures long for a companionship and misfortune with beings innocent of its cause. If she suffered herself, she would understand and pity him, but now she would not, or could not, find one word of comfort or love for him in his dire extremity. The sense of his absolute loneliness came home to his heart with a force that made him shudder. He swayed and fell forward with his face on the table, his arms stretched out, straight out, extended and rigid. Nina made a quick movement towards her father and stood looking at the gray head on the broad shoulders, shaken convulsively by the violence of feelings that found relief at last in sobs and tears. Nina sighed deeply and moved away from the table. Her features lost the appearance of stony indifference that had exasperated her father into his outburst of anger and sorrow. The expression of her face, now unseen by her father, underwent a rapid change. She had listened to Almayer's appeal for sympathy, for one word of comfort, apparently indifferent, yet with her breast torn by conflicting impulses raised unexpectedly by events she had not foreseen, or at least did not expect to happen so soon, with her heart deeply moved by the sight of Almayer's misery, 
knowing it in her power to end it with a word, longing to bring peace to that troubled heart, she heard with terror the voice of her overpowering love commanding her to be silent, and she submitted after a short and fierce struggle of her old self against the new principle of her life. She wrapped herself up in absolute silence, the only safeguard against some fatal admission. She could not trust herself to make a sign, to murmur a word for fear of saying too much, and the very violence of the feelings that stirred the innermost recesses of her soul seemed to turn her person into a stone. The dilated nostrils and the flashing eyes were the only signs of the storm raging within, and those signs of his daughter's emotion Almayer did not see, for his sight was dimmed by self-pity, by anger, and by despair. Had Almayer looked at his daughter as she leant over the front rail of the veranda, he could have seen the expression of indifference give way to a look of pain, and that pain pass away, leaving the glorious beauty of her face marred by deep, drawn lines of watchful anxiety. The long grass in the neglected courtyard stood very straight before her eyes in the noonday heat. From the river bank there were voices and a shuffle of bare feet approaching the house. Babalachi could be heard giving directions to Almayer's men, and Mrs. Almayer's subdued wailing became audible as the small procession bearing the body of the drowned man and headed by that sorrowful matron turned the corner of the house. Babalachi had taken the broken anklet off the man's leg and now held it in his hand as he moved by the side of the bearers, while Mamat lingered behind timidly in the hopes of the promised reward. Lay him there, said Babalachi to Almayer's men, pointing to a pile of drying planks in front of the veranda. Lay him there. He was a kafir and the son of a dog, and he was the white man's friend. He drank the white man's strong water, he added, with affected horror, that I have seen myself. The men stretched out the broken limbs on two planks they had laid level while Mrs. Almayer covered the body with a piece of white cotton cloth, and after whispering for some time with Babalachi, departed to her domestic duties. Almayer's men, after laying down their burden, dispersed themselves in quest of shady spots wherein to idle the day away. Babalachi was left alone by the corpse that laid rigid under the white cloth in the bright sunshine. Nina came down the steps and joined Babalachi, who put his hand to his forehead and squatted down with great deference. "'You have a bangle there,' said Nina, looking down on Babalachi's upturned face and into his solitary eye. "'I have, Mamputa, returned the polite statesman, then turning towards Mamet, he beckoned him closer, calling out, "'Come here.' Mamet approached with some hesitation. He avoided looking at Nina, but fixed his eyes on Babalachi. Now listen, said Babalachi sharply, the ring and the anklet you have seen, and you know they belong to Dane the traitor, and to no other. Dane returned last night in a canoe. He spoke with the Raja, and in the middle of the night left to cross over to the white man's house. There was a great flood, and this morning you found him in the river. By his feet I dragged him out, muttered Mamat under his breath. Tuan Babalachi, there will be a recompense, he exclaimed aloud. Babalachi held up the gold bangle before Mamat's eyes. What I have told you, Mamat, is for all ears. What I give you now is for your eyes only. Take. Mamat took the bangle eagerly and hid it in the folds of his waist cloth. Am I a fool to show this thing in a house with three women in it? He growled. But I shall tell them about Dane the traitor, and there will be talk enough. He turned and went away, increasing his pace as soon as he was outside Almayer's compound. 
Babalachi looked after him till he disappeared behind the bushes. Have I done well, Mam Puta? he asked, humbly addressing Nina. You have, answered Nina. The ring you may keep yourself. Babalachi touched his lips and forehead and scrambled to his feet. He looked at Nina, as if expecting her to say something more, but Nina turned towards the house and went up the steps, motioning him away with her hand. Babalachi picked up his staff and prepared to go. It was very warm, and he did not care for the long pull to the Raja's house. Yet he must go and tell the Raja, tell of the event, of the change in his plans, of all his suspicions. He walked to the jetty and began casting off the rattan painter of his canoe, the broad expanse of the lower reach with its shimmering surface, dotted by the black specks of the fishing canoes, lay before his eyes. The fishermen seemed to be racing. Babalachi paused in his work and looked on with sudden interest. The man in the foremost canoe, now within hail of the first houses of Sambir, laid in his paddle and stood up shouting, The boats! The boats! The man of war's boats are coming! They are here! In a moment the settlement was again alive with people rushing to the riverside. The men began to unfasten their boats. The women stood in groups looking towards the bend down the river. Above the trees lining the reach a slight puff of smoke appeared like a black stain on the brilliant blue of the cloudless sky. Babalachi stood perplexed, the painter in his hand. He looked down the reach then up towards Almeyer's house, and back again at the river, as if undecided what to do. At last he made the canoe fast again hastily, and ran towards the house and up the steps of the veranda. Tuan, Tuan, he called eagerly. The boats are coming, the man-of-war boats. You had better get ready. The officers will come here, I know. Almeyer lifted his head slowly from the table and looked at him stupidly. Mamputa, exclaimed Babalachi to Nina. Look at him. He does not hear. You must take care, he added meaningly. Nina nodded to him with an uncertain smile and was going to speak when a sharp report from the gun mounted in the bow of the steam launch that was just then coming into view arrested the words on her parted lips. The smile died out and was replaced by the old look of anxious attention. From the hills far away, the echo came back like a long-drawn and mournful sigh, as if the land had sent it in answer to the voice of its masters.